Hey there! Today, I'm going to be talking about virtual YouTubers, and specifically, I'm going to be talking about the philosophy behind the word virtual itself. I'm also going to be talking about Vocaloids, Otaku Culture, and a movie that I really like, so look forward to that one. We're going to go on a bit of a journey, and I hope you'll stick around for the whole trip. I mean trip in both senses of the word. At any rate, Enjoy the show, and without further ado, let's begin. What a funny place New York was. Always speaking up and full of windows. Mm, they built houses like that in the old days. Why? They'd no light inside their cities as we have, so they had to stick them up into the daylight. What there was of it. There's no properly mixed and conditioned air. Everybody lives half out of doors. They have windows of brittle glass. The age of windows lasted four centuries. These days, virtual YouTubers or VTubers are a huge phenomenon, with channels like Kizuna Ai obtaining millions of subscribers. All sorts of creators are now making videos and streaming as these animated virtual characters for audiences all around the world, including on sites outside of YouTube such as Billy Billy. To some, it might seem like this genre was an inevitable result of technologies interacting. But before there were VTubers, there was actually a different vision of the idol of the future. Vocaloid is a voice synthesizer software that was first released commercially in 2004. But if you know about Vocaloid, then you probably know it for what came three years later. Or rather, who came three years later. Hatsune Miku is arguably the world's most famous virtual idol. She's appeared in crossovers across various Japanese media platforms, and even sang live on the American talk show Late Night with David Letterman to a somewhat bewildered host. I say she sang, but that's the thing about Hatsune Miku. She's not a real person. Her voice comes from software that can string together syllables from a bank of voice recordings, and it was initially marketed at musicians and bands who lacked a vocalist. But pretty soon, an entire genre of Vocaloid-specific music had sprung up. These days, it's not surprising to see Hatsune Miku songs with millions of views online. She even has live concerts where fans can dance along with her holographic figure. And Miku gets really interesting when you approach her from the point of view of ontology. Ontology is, broadly speaking, studying existence and reality themselves. Who exactly are we cheering for when we pack these concert halls to watch what amounts to a hologram in some mp3 files? Some have argued that these avid fans of Hatsune Miku are doing a kind of ontology. A writer named Forrest Greenwood proposed that the way that Hatsune Miku is represented and the way that her fans interact with her is an attempt to materialize the ephemeral in everyday life. He was particularly keen on the concept of the otaku. You know otaku, the hardcore fans that people tend to imagine when they hear words like anime and idol. Greenwood argues that it is perhaps the medium of animation that restructures the otaku's perspective around this idol culture. You might have heard the phrase, the medium is the message. That's what this is. The mediums through which we view the world, like TV or YouTube, can actually shape our perceptions of the messages that go through them. And speaking of YouTube, the advent of the virtual YouTuber is really quite bizarre when you think about it. The concept of using an animated avatar itself isn't really a strange idea and isn't even unique to virtual YouTubing, but the way that entire communities have sprung up around this particular style of YouTubing might pose some interesting questions about what makes it so compelling. If we're looking at virtual YouTubers from the perspective of ontology, then we do run into the issue that there hasn't really been any attempt to explore this phenomenon in the past, at least not in the English language sources I've read. But in many ways, VTubers are the spiritual descendants of virtual idols like Hatsune Miku, so we can draw some interesting comparisons there. Both VTubers and Hatsune Miku are premised on this idea of not only clearly delineating reality from fiction, but also presenting fiction as possessing its own reality. 
There's a term from communications theory that's become quite popular called parasocial relationships. The term refers to the asymmetrical relationships that develop between artists and their viewers. An example I like to use a lot is People, a magazine devoted to following the lives of celebrities. Their website has pages for topics like the British royal family and today's must-see celebrity photos, and these pages have an almost voyeuristic feeling to them. These are fans that are knowledgeable about every minute detail of the lives of people who will never know their names. And this prompts a question. Are parasocial relationships even real? Or is it all just an illusion, a facade that has no bearing on reality? Specifically for our discussion, is our parasocial relationship with virtual YouTubers real? And what does this relationship, real or fake, do to the people behind the character. I recently watched the 1997 animated film Perfect Blue, directed by Satoshi Kon and based on the book Perfect Blue Complete Metamorphosis by Yoshikazu Takeuchi. The film depicts an idol named Mima Kirigoe as she announces the end of her tenure in the idol group, Cham, in pursuit of a new career as an actress. Mima is accompanied by her manager, Rumi, who was a former idol herself, and her agent, Tadokoro, who is a money-driven businessman. After announcing her career change, Mima starts receiving threatening messages from a stalker who goes by the moniker me mania, and she gradually begins to lose her grasp on reality as her public persona clashes with her private life. As the film goes on, we explore not only the life of someone who feels trapped by her own celebrity identity, but also the lives of the people for whom that identity is real. Henceforth, I'll be referring back to this film because, narratively, it maps really well onto our discussion of virtuality. The film concerns itself with perspective and how perceptions of reality are shaped by the world around us. Our interactions with virtual YouTubers are also mediated by perspective. We tend not to think too much about our computer screens because computers, at least in countries where access to the internet is commonplace, are pretty much accepted as part of our daily lives. But the writer Anne Friedberg would argue that our computer screens actually operate like a kind of window into a virtual world. She says the existence of a frame implies that there's a difference between what is outside the frame and what's inside it. And Friedberg goes on to say that the computer screen is an example of a kind of virtual window. Virtual here doesn't just mean digital, like with virtual reality headsets, but rather the philosophical concept of virtuality. In this context, Virtual means something that is functionally but not formally material. The Slovenian philosopher Slavoj Žižek explains this concept thoroughly in his 2004 documentary with the self-explanatory title, The Reality of the Virtual. We erase, abstract from the image of the other person, our partner, uh, certain features which are simply too embarrassing to be kept in mind all the time. Like, I talk to you. Of course, rationally, I know you are defecating, you are sweating, not to mention other things, but quite literally, when I interact with you, this is not part of the image I have of you. So when I deal with you, I'm basically not dealing with the real you. I'm dealing with the virtual image of you. And this image has reality, in the sense that it nonetheless structures the way I am dealing with you. To put this in the context of virtual YouTubers, the parasocial relationship between the viewer and the virtual YouTuber is, in a way, virtual. The character we're interacting with on screen isn't a real person in the formal sense. What we're seeing is a performance, done with an express purpose. This is similar to the concept of micro-celebrity, the way that online performers consciously form identities around gaining popularity, 
especially through seemingly intimate connection to their fans. We can see here how our interactions are mediated by the frames of reference we use. Our perspective, the way we view the world and interpret it, can be framed in many ways. This can either be a literal frame like that of an architectural window, or a more metaphorical frame, even the limitations of our language's ability to convey certain ideas. But in any case, the frames through which we view the world operate as virtual windows, an ontological cut that operates on a level beyond the material. One example of a virtual window is a term in theater called the fourth wall, which is the invisible boundary that exists between the stage and the audience. And in this case, the fourth wall actually operates in both directions. It prevents the actors from recognizing the existence of an audience, but it also conversely creates an environment where the audience can only recognize the world of the stage, not anything outside of it. Both the performers and the audience are compelled to act under the influence of a barrier that exists functionally, but not formally. One of the central conflicts in Perfect Blue is between the various forces that try to influence Mima. In particular, the relationships Mima has with Rumi, Tadokoro, and Mi Mania. Rumi, who was once an idol herself before changing careers like Mima, opposes the career change because she sees herself in Mima. Likewise, Tadokoro is in support of Mima's decision to become an actress because his position as a businessman leads him to view decisions on the basis of their financial viability, not their emotional significance. And finally, Mi Mania, the stalker, fantasizes over an idealized image of Mima's untarnished idol persona that he feels has been betrayed. What these people have in common is that they're all thinking of Mima as a virtual object, not as a person. They're all projecting themselves onto Mima, who herself has very little control over the way that people choose to identify with her. And this theme of Mima's struggle to hold onto her own sense of self in the face of these outside pressures carries through the entire film. It's not just that she's forced to put on a persona, but this persona reflects the economic and social conditions under which Mima lives. I don't get it. The science behind VTubers is so complicated and so well hypothesized that nobody can ever... I don't think I've seen this one either. Nobody can ever figure it out. There is a lot of debate among VTuber communities about the concept of simping, specifically if donating to a VTuber qualifies as simping. I'll try my best to make this understandable for people who don't know about this concept, but I will probably fail. So, okay, simping in English-speaking parts of the internet basically refers to a man who offers favors one-sidedly to a woman in the hope that it will reap dividends in the form of sex. Uh, you'll see a lot of people in VTuber communities talking about simping for their favorite idol or calling other people simps. It's kind of a weird term. I don't really like it, but that's how it is. Uh, but it's also kind of odd that this is a community that on the one hand is pretty much entirely built upon the personalities of mostly female streamers, and yet also routinely uses language that makes it sound like giving women money is like the most emasculating and degenerative thing you can do. How does that work? Um, well, I think that to start off with, this concept, at least as it appears in this community, is quite similar to the concept of the otaku that we mentioned earlier. Oh god, what, am, what is my life? A psychologist named Tamaki Saito wrote at length about the nature of otaku. He noticed that while many people are saying that otaku are fools who can't tell reality from fantasy, that otaku are actually uniquely strict about the difference between fantasy and reality. Saito wrote that otaku have the ability to find reality equally in both fiction and reality. He says that rather than confusing reality and fiction, otaku are especially keen about granting equal value to both. I once learned in school that decades ago, when the medium of film was in its infancy, spectators in movie theaters reacted to images of oncoming trains in horror, 
thinking that the train was going to fly out of the screen and into the audience. The idea is that back then people couldn't conceptualize screens and projections, so they genuinely believed that a moving image literally translated to a physical object. But actually, it's starting to seem like that isn't the historical case. Instead, the historian Tom Gunning argues that rather than a panicked audience fearing for their lives, the reactions of these early moviegoers to scenes of oncoming trains were of amazement at the extraordinary illusion that was brought about by moving pictures. They weren't naive. In fact, it was that they knew it was all an illusion that made the trick so fascinating to them. On the other hand, though, as extraordinary as the phenomenon can be, even illusions can do harm. Real, serious harm. Tadokoro is frustrated by Mima's lack of lines in her TV appearances, and demands more high-profile roles for her, fearful that her debut might be a failure. They receive an offer for a role in which Mima's character is raped in a strip club. And while Rumi is disgusted, Mima decides to go ahead with the job. She downplays the severity of the performance, saying, it's not as if I'm really getting raped. However, we see through the film that the rape scene has a profound impact on her mental stability, and it further fractures her sense of self and her awareness of what's real and what's fake. The writer Tanya Horik has discussed the distinctions between fantasy and reality in the context of pornography and rape. Horik talks about two movements that have developed around pornography, the anti-pornography movement, who argue that there exists such a strong relationship between fictional sexual violence and actual sexual violence that the former should be banned, and their critics who say that there can be no proven link between imagery and action. Horrock makes the case that while those who are skeptical of the anti-pornography movement have valid criticisms, they tend to ignore the way that thoughts can influence action. The debate over the connections between pornography and rape maintains the distinction between reality and representation as the cause of real rape. We need to think about how representation is a part of rape, for to acknowledge that there is not a simple causal relation between watching a representation of rape and committing one is not to say that there is not any relation at all. There is little doubt that the way rape is depicted in media can desensitize some people to this horrible crime and that's something that deserves more attention than it gets. Survivors of rape and sexual assault need to be heard and believed. I was hesitant about including this section, but I noticed that many reviews and discussions about Perfect Blue downplay or outright ignore this particular scene, which might say something about the way we as a society have come to view rape. I am not saying that all porn must be banned, although that is a route you can go down, but the fictional media we create and consume can have real, and at times harmful consequences. To use the film's language, sometimes illusions can come to life, and they can be dangerous if we pretend they can't. Throughout Perfect Blue, Mima's mental state deteriorates as the stalking and harassment intensify. She discovers a blog called Mima's Room that documents her daily life in minute detail, and soon people connected to Mima are found murdered. When Mima finds bloody clothes in her closet, she comes to believe that she herself has been unconsciously committing the murders. Scenes the audience think are part of Mima's daily life turn out to be themselves scenes on the set of the TV show, and neither the audience nor Mima are ever really sure if what they're seeing is real. This all culminates in the climax, where we learn that Rumi is the one who has been orchestrating the murders and is responsible for both the blog, Mima's room, and the stalker, Mi Mania, who was manipulated by Rumi pretending to be the real Mima. Rumi herself has come to identify so strongly with Mima that she actually develops a second personality and genuinely believes herself to be the true Mima, hell-bent on killing the imposter. In their final confrontation, Rumi chases Mima through the streets in the form of a spectral image of Mima's idol persona, with her haggard, real appearance symbolically reflected in windows and mirrors. It might be seen as 
concerning that people are speaking about VTubers with some potentially objectifying language. But at the end of the day, I know. Most people aren't using Simp seriously. They're using it ironically. It's a joke. They're using it to describe the relationship between fans and VTubers, and I know, that's obvious. But I think that obviousness is kind of what makes VTubers so interesting to me. See, the relationship that VTubers and their fans have is not unique to the industry. When we get down to the basics, VTubers aren't really that special. Anyone could tell you that VTubers are acting out characters. This isn't some mystery. We're all on some level aware of it. And it happens all around YouTube, not just among VTubers. Nobody genuinely believes that the avatar on screen is literally a person. And despite this, we choose to engage with these avatars, these characters, in a relationship. Epic theater is a style of performance that was pioneered by the playwright Bertolt Brecht. He thought that Rather than a realistic performance, what would best compel his audiences to think about his plays is a performance that makes them aware that what they're watching is just an act, a story. So Brecht broke down the fourth wall, and in doing so, both the characters and the actors can assess the performance more critically and draw their own conclusions. Brecht thought that there is value in both reality and fiction. At the end of Perfect Blue, Mima visits Rumi, who has been placed in a mental health facility. We find that, despite all the traumatic events of the film, Mima has decided to continue her career as an actress, and she's become quite successful. The events of the film have strengthened her, she's more confident, and at the very end, we get this exchange where two nurses wonder aloud if Mima is the real celebrity or just a look-alike. Our final shot of Mima, where she replies to no one in particular, I'm real, is framed through a mirror. In our day-to-day -day lives, the idea that something might be fake, might be deceiving us, is a terrifying thought. And indeed, it is all too easy to lose control of our own identities to the whims of economic and social expectations. The pressure to conform can be crushing, especially as social media turns us all into micro-celebrities. There exists within our virtual and parasocial relationships to one another a risk that we do identify too closely with a persona and lose track of reality. But it's also the virtual nature of our relationships that allows us to become close to one another in the first place. Just like a painting, the frames through which we experience the world define it and can make it beautiful. Virtual YouTubers, framed within our computer screens, open the door to a virtual world. They represent an open recognition of our virtual relationships. They highlight both the fictional nature of our online interactions and how even in that fiction, there is still a reality to be found. And on the one hand, this kind of relationship can lead to problems when certain people do feel betrayed by the disparity between a character they love and the actor behind the screen. But on the other hand, perhaps this kind of open relationship with a character, being able to openly see and acknowledge the fakeness of our interactions and then go on with them anyways, is more honest than the pretend reality of our day-to-day -day lives. Because if we're going to live in a fake world, why not enjoy it a little? I've got to go now. There's a stream starting soon. Thank you all very much for watching. If you enjoyed, then feedback, likes, and subscriptions are dearly appreciated. And until we meet again, as always, have a wonderful day.